Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Lynn Peters. I'm with the Department of Financial Institutions. Um, I'm going to preface by saying some of the information may be a little bit outdated. I got buried this last week and was not able to update all the information. Um, but it's it, there's a lot of information here. We're going to cover a lot of topics. Uh, but if you have questions, like she said, please, like Maureen said, please feel free to put your questions in the chat, and I will try to try to answer them as best possible. The first thing I have to say is this disclaimer, because I do work for a state agency that is a regulatory agency. So the comments and opinions expressed today by me are just mine. They are not the opinions and not don't necessarily reflect those of the Department of Financial Institutions, the management, or anyone associated with DFI. And we cannot give legal or financial advice, and we do not endorse or recommend any person, product, or institution. So some of the websites that I'm going to refer you to, most of them are government websites. Um, the other one are ones that we know that we've worked with that have done a good job, but we aren't saying they're the best or the only ones that you can use. So what we do at DFI, most folks have not heard of us, <clears throat> is we license and regulate financial institutions, the financial services industry within Washington State. Uh, we do protect and educate consumers. Our protection comes mostly through education, but also when we do examinations of the licensees, making sure that they are operating safely and soundly within the, the confines of the law, um, that keeps consumers safe. We educate consumers in the, the rules, the laws, and the regulations that are there to keep them safe, but also and basic financial information. We've done a we've done a couple of presentations with the Pierce County Library System prior. We did um, budgeting and saving and credit. So those are the types of topics that we talk about. We talk about identity theft. We'll talk about fraud. I think those are some upcoming presentations we'll have as well. Our goal is to well, our goal is to put myself out of a job, basically, of making sure that. Washington residents and consumers have the information and knowledge that they need to make safe and sound financial decisions and are no longer victims of fraud or scams um, and that they are always making safe and sound decisions so that they can find their own version of what I call financial freedom. So Here's our website, dfi.wa.gov. One of the things that we ask folks to do is if you're going to work with a, a, a person like a financial planner advisor, a bank, a credit union, a payday lender, mortgage broker, verify their license. Make sure that they're licensed to do what they do and make sure that they're in good standing with the state. Uh, you want to make sure that you're working with somebody who's on the up and up. Learn about scams and fraud that are out there. We have uh, on our news and alerts, we have information about the, the latest scams and frauds that are happening. We have a place where you can file a complaint if you run across a, a licensee of ours who is operating outside of the law, who is uh, violating the law, who is endangering consumers. If you think you've been taken advantage of, please file a complaint. It's easy. You can do it online. You can give us a call. Find out if we take an action against a company or a person through the enforcement actions that we post online. These are up forever at this point. Uh, we, you can go back to the beginning of the agency. I believe we're hitting almost 30 years now. Um, and find out what kind of action we've taken against companies. Now, we are working to update all of those enforcement actions to show whether or not somebody has, if we took action against them, if they did, you know, so to speak, did their time, if they've completed the things that we told them that they had to do and are now licensed again, those are just things to keep in mind that we had taken action against them, but they are in compliance today in some cases. We issue things like statement of charges, cease and desist orders, fines, denial or revocation of licenses, whether or not we recovered costs and consent orders. That's where a lot of times um, somebody may say, I, I don't agree that I did anything wrong, but I'm consenting to the decision by the agency to enforce penalties. Um, we have a very robust financial education site with a variety of topics. This arrow points off to the A to Z topics. We also have a pretty robust scam and fraud information website. The other site that I would recommend for that is the Attorney General's website as well. They have a great, uh, great website and you can sign up for alerts that get emailed directly to you. Uh, we do things on budgeting, uh, we do things on student loans, you can basically find any topic A to Z in here at the dfi.wana.gov. So the first thing we want to say about the student loans is that student loan payment pause has been extended to August 31st, uh, 2022. 
recognizing a lot of people lost their jobs or lost income during the pandemic because of the pandemic, the federal government put a pause on, on federal student loan payment requirements. So there's a pause on payments and there is no ish, uh, interest being accrued during this time. They were due to start being uh, repaid uh, next month, but they've extended that. There is a lot of talk about forgiving student loans. I get a lot of questions about people saying, should I just wait and hope that they forgive everybody's student loans? Well, I would say save your money, be ready to start making your payments starting on September 1, um, but don't count on student loans being forgiven. There are a lot of Specific requirements for student loans that do get forgiven. We have student loan forgiveness uh, for some organizations now or for some people now in the sense that if it was an entity that was a fraudulent entity that uh, that defrauded students, that uh, closed before students could finish their degrees, those types of things, those were forgiven. But there will be similar things attached to any forgiveness in the future. There are other forms of forgiveness. There's if you work for a nonprofit, if you work for a government, if you work for an industry like the um, police department, fire department, if you make a certain number of payments on time, consistently and consecutively, you can file for student loan forgiveness. I do have one friend who had that and actually completed it. She works for a nonprofit and she's for, had the last $40,000 of her student loans forgiven, which was pretty amazing. A great place to get your information is at studentaid.gov. This website is the federal student aid website. This is where you can get the official federal student loan information. You can find information about FAFSAs. You can find information about schools. You can find information about the process. You can, find, you can even come here to take a look at what your student loans are doing. The other one I would refer you to is the Washington Student Achievement Council. We have a student loan advocate here in our state, and there is a great wealth of information here on the, on the WASAC uh, website. They also partner with the uh, WA 529 and GET, uh, which are programs that allow parents to set money aside for their, well, not just parents, but anybody to set money aside for future students. SENSE is another one, the SENSE program. Uh, this organization is a nonprofit organization that was co-founded in 1995 by federal bankruptcy judge uh, Karen Overstreet and leading members of the Washington Bankruptcy Bar. SENSE is funded by foundation grants, special events, and individual contributions. They have two programs. They have what I call the pre and post loan help. So pre-loan is their debt slap program. It's talking to students about um, the cost of student loans and, and thinking it all the way through before you take student loans out and understanding that um, there are options and alternatives. And it's a great program. They work with high school students throughout the state to uh, show them, here's how you check out your school. Here's how you check out what it's going to cost. Here's how you check out if they have student aid. Here's how you find out how to apply for that student aid all the way through there. And then if you are post student loan and you are needing help because Federal student loans are one of the only things you cannot get rid of in a bankruptcy. They are with you for life um, unless the federal government forgives them, which is rare. So the student loan project with SENSE, they work with people who are struggling. We, we saw a lot of folks in the, the foreclosure crisis in the 2008 to 2012 foreclosure crisis um, who were facing foreclosure because of their student loans. So we had attorneys and um, counselors who worked in the student loan project to work with people uh, who were facing foreclosure or just financial distress facing bankruptcy um, because of their student loans. So that's another program that will help you if you have student loans and are struggling underneath the debt. So talking about all this debt and how difficult it is, why would we do it? Um, well, it's because it's important. School is expensive. The average cost of college in the United States, this was as of, I think, 2018, was $35,331 per student per year, including book supplies and daily living expenses. 
I don't know too many people who can come up with an extra $35,000 a year to pay out of pocket for someone to go to college, whether it's themselves or a student, uh, especially if it's themselves, because it's difficult to work and go to school at the same time. It's not impossible, and we do recommend it if you can, but it is difficult. The average cost of college has more than doubled in the 21st century with an annual growth rate of 6.8%. That is a massive growth, uh, not as much as our inflation at the moment, but it is a massive growth. The average in-state student attending a public four-year institution spends about $25,487 for one academic year. Uh, that's just the tuition, right? So that becomes pretty expensive. Again, I don't know too many people who can afford that out of pocket. That's why we use student loans. Why would we go into debt? Well, because as you have a degree, your income generally rises depending on what your degree is in. So this slide here talks about um, if you've got an associate's degree, your average income is about $51,000, a little bit less than 52. Uh, it, that's an occupational program. If you do an associate's academic, it could be about 53. You get into the bachelor's degree, there's a big jump. You can move up to 82,000. Um, master's degree, again, 94,000, it jumps with each additional degree, right? So in addition to the higher earnings, you know, your un unemployment rates tend to be lower as you get more education because it, it, it tends to make it a little bit easier to find a job. Most employers today uh, who have the higher salaries are going to ask you, where's your degree? What Can you prove that you have a diploma? And that's what this slide is about. Is This, is, this was the unemployment rate in 2014. Um, the higher the degree, you've got your doctors up there. Not a lot of unemployed doctors, right? Um, professional degrees, master's degrees, um, bachelor's degrees. The unemployment rates are less as you go higher up. The income is great, generally higher as you go up with those higher degrees. Now you're going to pay more for those as well. There are a variety of student loans. There are subsidized Stafford loans, unsubsidized Stafford loans, Parent PLUS loans. Um, these, I warn parents, these are a great resource. However, be very careful because you do owe the money on this. Um, this is borrowed by you and it's up to you who pays it off. The student can be required to pay it off, but it does come back to you. Remember that. Perkins loans, um, consolidated loans, and private loans. Private loans have a benefit in that they can, if you face bankruptcy, you can include those in bankruptcy, um, but they can be sold more often than your regular student loans. They can, uh, the private companies can require you to pay them back sooner. There's a lot of things that can happen with those private loans and they tend to come at much higher interest rates. So national student loan debt is pretty high, uh, 1.5 trillion for over 44 million people. And I believe that number goes up almost day daily. The average student loan payment in 2018 was $351, and those numbers are going higher. Of course, like I said, right now we're on a payment pause. So in 2020, that pause was enacted, I believe, in May, April, May, um, and it's still in place. The average debt per graduate is $37,000 which doesn't sound like a whole lot for a college degree, but in most cases, most people I've talked to, it's a lot more than that because they aren't gonna pay it all off at once, which means you pay interest. So when you talk about this, when you've got this type of debt, this is the equivalent of a down payment on a home, although that price is really old because now you can barely find anything for under 300,000. Um, payment on cars, full payment for, for used vehicles, weddings. Uh, don't know how many people here would go for swimming pools, but you can buy a swimming pool. Startup costs for businesses, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with $37,000, right? Um, we're doing home repairs for our house. Federal versus private. So federal loans, you don't have any payments until you graduate. Private loans, you gotta pay them while you're still in school. Uh, interest rate is fixed on the federal loans. Private loans are often variable and sometimes higher than 18%. That's really high. Uh, loans can be consolidated into a direct consolidation loan with the federal loans. Private loans, not so much, not a direct consolidation loan. You have to go get a separate uh, uh, private consolidation student loan. And again, those can come with higher interest rates. 
uh, federal loans can offer forbearance and deferment often, uh, uh, options. Um, you can get a forbearance where you pay your interest. You can get a forbearance where you don't pay your interest. Um, the forbearance options, forbearance, and for I can talk, forbearance and deferment options may not always come with the private loans, but in many cases you can negotiate with a private lender to get, get those. There are loan forgiveness options, like I said, with police, fire department, teachers, nonprofit organizations, state employees, those types of things, you can file for that. There are very rarely forgiveness uh, with private loans. And there's no prepayment fee if you pay it off early with a federal student loan where there might be, you gotta read the fine print, always read the fine print with a private student loan. Interest is what kind of kicks us all in behind, right? Interest is a charge for the privilege of borrowing money typically expressed as an annual percentage rate. You wanna know what those APRs are on all of your loans. And the student loans come at different APRs and a lot of folks don't realize that they have those different APRs. When you do a consolidation, they use a, an algorithm to determine a median range for that. So it won't be the same as your lowest student loan, but it won't be the same as your highest student loan. So these slide decks were put together by a former employee of ours. Uh, this was her sample student debt. She had $76,000 in student debt. $51,000 was a parent plus loan and 25,000 was subsidized or unsubsidized loans. That was a lot. So here's how it broke down. Uh, she had, you know, big principles at varying interest rates that came up throughout her, her college career to grand total of $51,000 and paying them back, when you start looking at your payments, there's different options. There's standard payments, there's graduated payments, there's payments um, by income. There's a variety of ways you can pay them back. The longer you take, the lower your, in your payment, but the higher amount of interest that you pay and the higher your total amount, and the longer it takes to get them paid off. Now, when I paid my student loans, um, I went through a divorce, and ended up putting my loans on deferment and they accrued interest during that time. When I came back to start making my payments, I had gone from $19,000 in debt to $26,000 in debt. And I took a long time to pay them off. So I ended up paying almost $40,000 in student loans instead of that $19,000 because I took almost 30 years to pay them off. Student loans can be stressful, right? So there are ways you can go around, you can mitigate that stress. Apply for scholarships and grants. Every, almost every school has them. Your local community, I got one from Kiwanis. I got one from the Lions Club when I was in school. There are websites that offer information about them. You should never pay somebody to go find scholarships for you because you can do this for yourself for free. Um, understand your loans, know what your interest rate is understand what the payoff amounts are, understand what the payoff requirements are. Try not to take out more debt than your first year salary. And that goes back to knowing what the career is gonna be when you get out of school. And understanding that you need to look at it from a beginning point. You need to look at it and say, this is the entry level payment. You don't look at what somebody makes after they've been there for 10 years. You wanna make sure you're looking at the entry level. Uh, low monthly payments, we said, are not always the way to go because they can require uh, a lot more interest and a lot more time. Lower your principal if you can. Federal student loan services let you change your payment plan when needed. So if you lose your job, if you have a reduction in pay, if you have significant life changes, like I said, for me, it was a divorce at the time. They're very good at working with you on that. The income-driven repayment plan, a lot of folks go for this. My husband was doing this until the, the payment paused. Uh, lets you make a payment based on how much money you make. So it reduced what he would have been paying about $900 a month down to $600 a month. Much more livable, <clears throat> much easier for us to make payments that way. Defaulting on student loans, you're considered delinquent if you miss one, but you're in default if you miss about nine months worth of payments. And they do get in touch with you. They will reach out and ask you what's going on. How can we get the payments started up again? How can we help you with this? They don't want you to be in such bad shape. You're going to lose a home. You're going to you know, lose your car, lose your job, whatever. But they want to make sure that they're getting their money. It's a loan. We have to. Uh, we already talked about this. 
So the interest rates, this was 18 to 19. I don't have the new updated ones. I haven't looked at it since they put the pause on, but they were 5% for direct subsidized. 6.6 .6 for undergraduate for graduate unsubsidized and 7.6 for the parent plus loans. Um, my husband's current interest rate, I believe, is 5.6 for his consolidated loan. Um, and we ended up deciding we're going to pay it off with the money from our refi because we only paid 2.99% on our refi, whereas he's paying 5.6 on his student loans. So we're making those decisions. Um, private student loan interest rates vary, but are generally higher than the federal's. <clears throat> there are federal aid borrowing limits, so you can't just borrow you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars with no cause. Undergrad students are 5,500 to 12,500 per year in subsidized and unsubsidized loans, depending on what school you go to, and your income and your, um, your financial status up to $5,500 per year on Perkins loans. The parent of a dependent undergrad student um, is for the, you, you are asked to fill out the rest of your child's education costs. So they will always come back to the parent. If you're an adult like myself and my husband were when we went, they will say you're responsible for the remainder of your student, uh, of the cost of your education. So the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, this is what everybody wants you to fill out. Um, this is what you need to fill out in order to get your student aid. So the things that we say is we say, visit the schools you're interested in, take a look at which one's your potential colleges, do some research on them, file your FAFSA, uh, take a look at what you're getting for your award letter and decide what aid to accept. You want to look at a variety of things, and we're going to go through a few slides in here. You want to look at work study. It's a federal program that allows you to work on campus, and it applies directly to your student loans, or it applies to your college um, tuition. So that would reduce the amount of loans that you need to take out. You earn at least the federal minimum wage, which granted is not a lot, but it is better than nothing. Uh, the washboard has access to scholarships, this is a great place to go research them. Um, and look at your local organizations and businesses. You would be amazed. There is a scholarship out there for left-handed artists. There are scholarships for people who were born in certain cities. There are scholarships for just about everything. So it's really important that you take the time. If you do nothing else, Google it, um, and then verify the organizations uh, that they're a legitimate organization before you do any business with them. We talked about the loan forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness program is one that a lot of folks who work for Washington State, uh, our agency has several people who are going through that program right now. And some employers actually will help employees pay back their student loans. Uh, some of the big uh, tech firms are saying, we will help you pay with your student loans as a benefit for um, uh, to entice people to come work for them. Military, you have the GI Bill to help pay for college, um, and some folks just decide to make a career out of the military so that they uh, um, they can use their GI Bill, go to school while they're in school while they're in the military, but make a career out of it. Research your colleges. CollegeScorecard.ed.gov lets you go through and see what is it going to cost you, what kind of programs and degrees do they have. You can do searches on what's their, what are their graduation rates, um, what, do pe what do people make when they get out of school. So this is where our former employee went. Uh, she wanted to get away from Washington and try someplace new. She had heard about this place with, uh, she thought she wanted to go into the culinary arts. This place kind of specialized in the culinary arts. So the average annual cost is 23,000. Their graduation rate is only 58%. And the salary after attending was only $38,000. Remember she had $76,000 in student loan debt when she got out. That was quite a bit. <laughs> um, so had she known now, or known then what she knows now, she probably wouldn't have gone here. She probably would have picked somewhere else that was a little uh, more in line with what she wanted to do. She also changed her major in her first year, and that's something that's very common. And we tell people, don't be afraid of that. Um, I don't know too many people who today, I'm 55 years old, 
there is no way 18 year old me would have ever seen me doing what I'm doing now. Um, I had stage fright and was horrified about talking in public and now it's what I do for a living. Um, I have changed careers several times throughout my life. I started off in journalism. I've worked in Alaska. I've worked in food service. I was a baker. I made wedding cakes. I've done a little bit of everything uh, until I found the, my true calling, my passion of doing outreach with consumers with a state agency. And I've been here 15 years now. Um, but I was 40 when I started here. So I tell people, give yourself some slack, you know, Experiment a little bit in those first couple of years in school when you're just doing those general studies, you're getting your, your, uh, your English and your math out of the way. Um, experiment a little bit. Uh, look at different colleges and campuses, compare financial aid offers, visit campuses if you can. A lot of folks are looking at going out of state, getting away from mom and dad. Uh, but the other thing we say is start at a community college, but make sure it transfers credits to the college that you want to go to at the end for your final degree. Um, there are several local universities that have contracts with local community colleges for specific programs. My husband went to Clover Park, got his associate's degree in environmental studies which directly transferred to UWT. They have a contract. So he knew that all of his credits were going to transfer and he wasn't going to lose credits. I started in Oregon State and uh, ended up transferring up here. I finished at Evergreen, but Evergreen only accepted half of my journalism degree uh, credits because they said they consider them after a certain point to be electives, even though it was part of my major. So those are always things to look at. Here's some comparison between uh, community college versus university here in our state. Olympic College uh, at total for two years is $9,518. Add two more years for university, you've got $56,000. Going straight through a university, almost $100,000. So there is give and take on all of these things. Um, she didn't include room and board on the Olympic College, but you would still need to account for that somehow, right? Uh, unless you're living at home with mom and dad. And even then, as an adult, my advice is make sure that you're giving your parents some money for groceries, paying a bill or two here and there, like the electric, things like that. Um, in state versus out of state, this is another big one. And she went out of state, so she paid extra for that one. She went to Colorado. Uh, this is a comparison between Washington State University and University of Oregon. It's a big jump. Uh, 9,884 tuition for one year versus 34,000 for one year. So sometimes if you want to go to a school that's out of state, it may pay to go and work for a year and establish residency and then go. Look at trade schools. There are a lot of folks uh, that, you know, are have a strong aptitude for certain skills. Right now, we have a strong need for people in this in the skill industry. I am dying to have a an electrician, a plumber, um, and a contractor. It's really difficult finding contractors these days. Um, and having an electrician who specializes in, I have a really old house. It's from 1908. So it has very particular wiring. I've got four different kinds of wiring in my house. I need a special kind of electrician who's, who's willing and able to get in there and see all the different things and work with it. Finding these skills is becoming very difficult. The people who used to do this on a regular basis are retiring now. And a lot of our younger folks are not doing them. Average tuition is usually a lot less. And they typically offer programs that are two years or less, and then you do an apprenticeship. And there's some great apprenticeship programs, and sometimes there's union. Trade school careers, um, we didn't get all the information on this, but look at, you know, electrician, $50 an hour, $740. Um, oh, that is not where that goes. Oh, yeah, $50,740. Uh, plumbers starting at $50,000. At, let me tell you, I think those numbers are low. I think those are from 2015. Uh, folks are making a lot of money in, in the trade school, in the trade industry. It's really important that we have these things. We need them to keep our society going, to keep our houses in shape. Um, cosmetology, I go see a mani-pedi person. I go have my hair styled. These are things that we, we will always need, right? One of the things that I don't see on here that is interesting, uh, I, it's not a trade school career, but it is something you need an apprenticeship to do, is working in the, the mortuary industry. 
a friend of ours, his son ended up going to work in this industry and it pays really, really well. You have to be willing to work in a very unique environment, um, but, and it is something that we will always need. It is a service we will always need. That's something I tell people is to think about when you're going into a career, also think about the longevity of your career. Um, when I went into news, I thought newspapers would be around forever, but I was wrong. <laughs> uh, within 10 years of being in the industry, we could see the newspapers starting to shutter um, and they were transitioning and everything was going digital. We saw a mass exodus of the folks who were a generation ahead of me who didn't want to do everything on computers. Um, and now we have the, the next generation, which is they're used to being more of the community bloggers and we're seeing a lot of that as well. But look for an industry that's going to be around for a while if it's something that you love. The other thing you have to think about is you still have to have savings. You still have to budget when you're in college because you might need to do a plane ticket home. You might have car repairs. You're going to have books and lab fees, things that come up. Um, you want to have a rainy day fund. You want to have a saving for a large purchase. You want to go on vacation with your friends, like a spring break. And yes, you're only in your 20s, but you do need to think about your retirement. So you need to have something going towards a retirement plan because you don't want to be me. I was the poster child for what not to do until I started working here at age 40. I didn't have a retirement plan until I was 40. So I'm way behind the game. Uh, and it's taking a lot of effort to try and make sure that I can get caught up. I'm going to have a much different retirement than a lot of folks. Um, I'm going to be very different than my, my father-in-law who invested in Starbucks in the early 90s. He's the only millionaire that I know. I, uh, I am going to live a much simpler life than he is, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. Always, always, always look at the long term and think about retirement. When you're thinking about a job choice, a career choice, think about some options, job shadows, internship, volunteer to do some work. See if you like the job. We've had some job shadows and some interns come to DFI and shadow or, or internship with us and find out mm, this isn't what they wanted to do. And it's so much better to find that out in their first year of school or second year of school when they can change their major and have a much better outcome at the end and have a job that they love. Um, have a meeting with somebody in the industry. Ask about beginning salaries. What are their college requirements? What's the best thing they love about their job? What's the worst thing they hate about their job? Get those things in advance. Um, I was lucky when I was in high school. I thought I wanted to be a firefighter. Talk to a firefighter about the worst things on the job and change my mind right then and there. Um, so that was never, that did not go any further than my actual high school. Take a class, take a class that you think, I. this sounds interesting, but maybe not part of your actual decision to go for a career. This is how I changed majors my first year. I started off pre-med, but the, uh, the chemistry and math kill, killed me. <laughs> um, so I had taken a random class on marketing and uh, journalism, and it really pinged with me. So this is what I ended up doing. I decided to go into communications. Um, it's okay to change your mind. Have a discussion with your family up front. And parents, please talk to your kids up front and be open and willing to let them have some changes in those first couple of years because it's so important for them to feel supported in that process so that they can make a choice in the end that will stick with them that is valuable and that supports them for their life. Um, what you don't want is, you know, the one that we refer to as a seven-year senior who can't figure out what they want to do for the first four years. You don't want that, but you do want to encourage them to look at different things before they make a decision that's gonna impact their life in the end. My mom was somebody who went to school, got her degree, came out, decided, ooh, that's not what I wanted to do. Went back to school, got another degree, did that for 10 years, eh, that's not what I wanna do. Went back to school, got her last degree, decided this is what she loved and that's what she did until she retired. But she had to go to school three times for that. And that's not something that you want. Take a look at career exploration. Look at what's out there. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a great website where you can go look at this and see what's out there. So this is something that 
the person who put this slide, this, these slide decks together, this is the former employee, she was going to go be a baker. And had she known that the uh, median pay was only $25,000, but remember $76,000 in student loan debt, she probably would not have gone to this career. She ended up changing and going to communications and ended up coming and working for us here at DFI. It was a much better deal for her. Then the other thing is, because you love it, it may not necessarily be the job that you want. Uh, when I worked as a baker, I loved my job. I absolutely loved it. But then I refused to do any baking or cooking at home. I just didn't want to do at home what I did at work. So keep that in mind too. And look at it as a SMART goal. As have specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals for what you want to do with school and how you want to pay for it. Um, define your goal. I want to go to a four-year university in Washington State. I want to go to a two-year trade school and get into an apprenticeship program. What is it going to take to get there? Do your research. Go find out where you can get those, those certifications, those degrees. How are you going to pay for it? Are you going to do student loans? Are you going to do work through school? Are you going to uh, do work study? What are you going to do? Um, celebrate your successes. Celebrate those victories when you've picked your school, you've decided how you're going to pay for it, you've calculated out what you're going to be making in your first year as a starting person, um, and that you can pay your student loans, and keep your eye on the goal. It's hard. It's uh, not fun all the time. College is great, uh, but when you get out and you see the, the first student loan bill that comes six months later, it can be quite the shock uh, for both parents and students. But um, keep your eye on the goal and say, hey, I went to school to get a job in something that I love that I can do forever. Uh, and that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm proof positive that you can, you can get a degree, you can get a job you love and um, pay your bill. <laughs> Those are all the, the important things. And you can still afford to go on vacation. I'm leaving for Colorado in two weeks to go hiking. So living proof it can be done. Questions, I see Khalil and Fatima are still with us. Do you, if you have any questions, please pop it into the chat. If you don't, um, I have a uh, presentation survey that I would love for you to fill out if you can. Um, we, basically what I tell people is if, if I suck for you, I'm gonna suck for the next guy, unless I know from you uh, how bad it was. 